Okay, well, slide two. Um, we're going to talk about tier two and three uh, consider, inter, inter, considerations for designing tier two and tier three interventions. And um, much of what I'm referencing in terms of um, the types of skills that we're going to target in these tier two and tier three interventions are highlighted in the What Works Clearinghouse Practice Guide. And I encourage you to take a look at that. Next slide. Um, I really want to be clear that tier two and tier three are supplemental supports. And so the content that Professor Duke shared is actually more important than what I'm sharing, because if we get tier, two, tier one right, very few students are going to need tier two and tier three. And, you know, as a general rule of thumb, if your tier one reading curriculum is not uh, supporting the reading development of the vast majority of kids in your classroom, at least 80%, um, your curriculum needs to be switched out or you need to figure out how to amplify your use of that curriculum. So tier, and two, tier two and tier three are supplemental supports provided to students who are not responding to the tier one environment. Um, so tier two is usually that first added tier um, kids might get this extra supplemental um, support system for a year. In some models, it's two years. And then the idea is that we add on tier three when children are not sufficiently responding to tier two. Um, and in actually the classic models of response to intervention approaches, you have tier one, you have tier two, you have tier three, and it's that tier three that's synonymous with identification of a reading disability. And so conceptually, you have a child who's had this phenomenal tier one instruction like Nell described, this add-on support via tier two for several years, and at tier three, you have reasonable evidence that even in the context of good instruction, this child um, may in fact have a, um, a reading disability. Next slide. So again, just to reiterate, the idea of tier two, let's just focus on tier two. It's more intensive and specialized interventions. Um, and so what we're going to do is layer on this the type of things that um, Nell was talking about, highly efficient instruction that tackles foundational skills as well as um, more advanced skills. And we're identifying children on the basis of, of their responsiveness to the tier one um, curriculum using robust tools designed to identify children's responsiveness or lack thereof. Uh, it is absolutely unequivocal that tier two and tier three are not a substitute for tier one. And in fact, the worst thing we wanna do is pull kids out of tier one and give them only the supplement. And that can be um, harmful to children and have an unintended consequences. Next slide. Okay. Um, so this, the purpose is to offer this more intensive specialized intervention as an augment to tier two, to tier one, and these should be designed to accelerate skill development through the provision of specialized, more intensive supports. The goal of these is actually preventive in nature. So we're going to augment the tier one um, curriculum with these tier two system of support, and we're trying to reduce children's risk for um, having a reading disability. Okay, next slide. So when you're designing, um, I'm going to, again, focus in on tier two because it's the most common types of supplement that we're going to provide. The decisions that need to be made um, do have to focus on group size in the um, sort of classic articles on response to intervention. Um, you see in kindergarten, first grade, and perhaps second grade um, researchers in these large scale early tests would group children um, typically in smaller groups of about three to five kids. Um, obviously, there's decisions that have to go into um, group formation. Um, as, as Nell said, really great teachers use flexible grouping approaches. So if you're using data, you're observing, you're going to use the data to um, create flexible groupings. These are not just static groups you put kids in over, say, a year. And these are typically extra 20 to 30 minute sessions per week that are an add-on 
to the supplemental curriculum. Um, and in my opinion, the best tier two that I've seen are highly structured, um, a fairly structured framework that follows a sequence um, that attends to um, students' motivation, which I highlighted first, and I'll mention why in a second, then those foundational skills, and then we cannot forget that we have to work on reading for understanding or comprehension. Next slide. Okay, and I did want to just comment briefly that there are lots and lots and lots of models out there. And so I just pulled up Michigan's MTSS Technical Assistance Center um, and looked at what some of their um, guidelines that they were presenting. And so I wanted to put this up here as an example of how what I'm talking about is actualized in everyday practice. Okay, next. Okay, I, when we are identifying kids for additional supports, um, kids are not unaware that this is happening. Um, and we want to proceed very, very cautiously when we start to give kids additional tiers of support. Um, and going back to use um, Nell's uh, language, let's take a, an asset orientation. And the reason I bring this up is because motivation in reading are very intimately intertwined. If you have kids who are not motivated towards reading or have a poor self-concept con about reading, they're gonna read less and, and therefore get less practice in this really important skill. So um, I, gave, I put a link here to a recent article about some, some, te some excellent teachers gave advice about how they've addressed motivation towards reading, but we wanna attend to both the child's self-confidence or self-concept as a reader um, you know, am I a good reader? Am I a struggling reader? And then also their beliefs about reading and ideally have a motivation towards believing that reading is important and something they want to do. So always keep this asset orientation at the top of the list of structuring these um, additional tiers of support. Um, and then jumping to the next slide, um, the typical tier two intervention as described in countless research articles is going to give pretty significant attention to these foundational reading skills like phonemic awareness, graphing phoneme correspondence, decoding, um, uh, reading some connected text for fluency. Um, but it also, if you wanna to jump to the next slide, we have to be really cautious about the temptation to ignore reading comprehension that we often see in tier two um, sessions. And so a lot of the early models of tier two is this really relentless focus on foundational skills. But when we do that, we're crowding out um, attention to really important comprehension skills, such as inferencing or teaching um, more abstract vocabulary words, engaging in text structure analysis. So we have to, as, as Nell mentioned, we have to make sure that that integrates um, into our tier two and in fact has a complementary um, feel to the more foundational work we're doing. Next. Um, I'm simply at this point reiterating um, what Professor Duke shared. The only way for tier two to work is if it's data driven. We have got to be very thoughtful about the kids that we're going to provide tier two for, who we're going to provide tier two for. And then we have to provide ongoing monitoring of data because kids should come in and come out of tier two interventions. Um, and a lot of the early, really exciting studies about um, provision of tier two supports and early reading instruction is kids graduate out of tier two. So you have a group of kids, we might call them early responders, where they get tier two maybe for 10 weeks of an add-on and um, teachers look at the data and say, okay, uh, tier two is no longer needed. And then you have another group of kids who might respond and then graduate over the next 10 weeks and, and so on and so forth. And so this is not a static disposition towards kids. Oh, you're struggling, here's your tier two and you're gonna sit here like this for the next two years. That is not at all what um, response to intervention models are about. And it's about careful, thoughtful, close monitoring of kids and then adding and removing tiers on the basis of what the data is telling you. Next slide. Okay, I got to my last slide, I think, without a moment to uh, spare. 